Happy Sabbath to you. I am thankful for the Sabbath hours. They are a wonderful time to give a sigh of relief, <laughs> of relaxation. And even when you're speaking sometime, that can be the case. And I look to the Lord for that right now. I look forward to sharing with you what the Lord's put on my heart. But first, I want to uh, just have another prayer. You might turn this down just a little bit. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you for the opportunity that I have right now to, to be a tool in your hand. Every one of us humans, when we think of the responsibility of sharing your word, it is not what we humans are up to. <laughs> but I thank you that you don't leave us alone. And I pray for your Holy Spirit, Lord, to fill my heart and life and fill every life here that by your grace you would speak to us, that we would know that you have brought a message to us personally. So blessed to that end, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I want to see if you can figure out who I am going to talk about tonight by giving a few descriptions of this individual. Uh, first, I'll start with what his name means. Now, that just narrowed it down. You know it's a man now. But his name means experienced or dedicated. It comes from a word that means discipline. So his name means experienced or dedicated. Any, anyone think you know? Raise your hand if you think you know, but I won't call on you yet. No one yet? Probably Pastor Burgess, <laughs> Brother Burgess would know. <laughs> All right, well, um, it's a common name that uh, different patriarchs, different ones in the Bible, had children by the same name, but a different one that I'm going to be talking about. In fact, Cain had one by this name. So did Abraham, and uh, so did Reuben. Anyone know yet? You think you know. Okay, hold that thought. You may. All right, well, he was born uh, to a 162-year-old man named Jared. Okay, I think I might have heard that. All right, when he was born, Adam was only 622 years old. He was middle-aged only. 622. Adam was his great-great-great-great-grandfather. Adam died when he was over 300 years old. Do you know who this is yet? Some of you do. He was the great-grandfather of Noah. Everyone will know it by this one. He was translated about 57 years after Adam died. Who are we talking about? Enoch. Enoch. Dedicated. Had an experience with God. Enoch was translated 55 years before Seth died. His great-great-great-grandfather died after he was translated. He was translated almost 70 years before his great-grandson Noah was born. But Noah took on what he found, or what he heard, about his great-great-grandfather. Or great-grandfather, rather. Today... I've entitled this message, Enough for Enoch. Enough for Enoch. Enoch found enough. Here's my thesis statement, by the way. Enoch found enough in Jesus 
to walk with God, to please Him, and also to give His life in unselfish service. And so can you. We're going to look at one, we're, we're, we're going to be looking at three passages today. We're going to spend time looking at each of those passages. They're not real long, although we're planning to read a whole book of the Bible tonight. But it's a short one, one that mentions Enoch. We're going to be looking at Genesis 5. We're going to be looking at Hebrews 11 and the book of Jude. And we're going to find three descriptions. Each of these passages give us one little link in some truths and some lessons about Enoch that show how Enoch found enough. So the first one is that Enoch found enough motivation and power to walk with God through his communion with him. Enoch found enough motivation and power to walk with God through his communion with him. Go with me to Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5, we'll be looking uh, at five verses here. Four verses here from verse 21 to 24. It's a short story <laughs> as far as a summarized story of 365 years of life and ministry just in four verses. So go with me here. Uh, 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 Genesis chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. He's the one, he's the oldest man that ever died. Enoch is the oldest man that ever lived. You understand that, right? Did I say that right? Yeah. Um, so he begat Methuselah, and there was something that happened with, with, with uh, Enoch when he had his son. There was something that he was gathering more. He, was, he had a growing experience with Jesus, with God. And I say with Jesus without much apology here because he knew from his great-great-great-great-grandfather exactly what went on in, in the Garden of Eden and what happened after. And God specifically gave him in the spirit of prophecy an understanding of Jesus who was to come, the Son of God. So he knew Jesus. He personally knew Jesus. He knew about him and he had connected with him. So I unashamedly say Jesus here. Uh, so... He lived 65 years, but there was something about after he had his son Methuselah that he began to understand more of his relationship with his heavenly father. It was just deeper. It was more. He saw it better after having his son. And he goes on, or this, the description goes on in verse 22, and Enoch walked with God. He walked with God. Wow. He walked with God. God is not a respecter of persons in that he won't do for some what he does for others when they come to him the same way. He walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. What a beautiful four-verse description of a life of power. Four verses, 365 years of real connection well, at least once he got the picture, but I'm certain that his great-great-great-great-grandfather, Adam, started as early as he could understand 
and sharing the real deal about a real God who loves us really truly. So, let's look at a few things about Enoch here. We read here that he walked with God 300 plus years. Interesting. It was in it wasn't, we're told, in a, a trance or vision that he walked with God, but it was in real life. It was how he washed the toilet. It's how he lived his life when no one was watching. It was, it was who he was in the purity of his personal life. It was all of life. It was, it was personal, it was private, and it was public too. He wasn't a hermit, but he worked for God. He, he had a work to do for God, and he worked for God. He worked in his family. He worked in con, in, in, as he was connecting with men as a husband and a father and a friend and a citizen. He was steadfast, unwavering. I'm a servant of God. And everyone knew it. No one said, I don't think so. You should see him when he goes home. You should see him in his dorm room. Oh, no. No one said that because they knew he lived the same way there that he does in the pulpit. Um, and he was a servant of the Lord, and his heart was in harmony with the will of God. For, as the, as the Bible says in Amos 3.3, 3, how can two walk together unless what? They be agreed. He was in harmony with heaven. But you know what? That wasn't enough for Enoch. He had a true, genuine relationship with God through communion with him, but it wasn't enough to stay there. He wanted to share what he had. It was too good to hold, it on, to, hold on to it just for himself. So Enoch was a public teacher of the truth in the age in which he lived. He taught the truth. He lived the truth. You see, he had the same story on Facebook that he gave when he was in the pulpit. In fact, if you looked at all, if he had it, if you looked at all his Instagram reels, it would reveal, I'm sold out to God. I'm all about that. That's it. That's me. You want me? That's what you got. A servant of God. And it's good stuff. And I want you to have it too. There wasn't a mixed message in his life, publicly or privately. In his character and in every way, it was harmonious with greatness and the sacredness of his mission on his mind. He was a prophet that spoke as he was moved by the Holy Spirit. And he was a light amid the moral darkness, a pattern man, a man who walked with God. He was obedient by faith, not because he had to, but because he got to. What a blessing. Instead of saying, I gotta do all that? No, he said, I get to do this? I get to be like you? Wow. My, that's something worth telling. Now, God would demonstrate to the, uni to the universe the falsity of Satan's charge that man can't keep the law. He would demonstrate that through, that though man had sinned, by the way, had Enoch sinned? You can know he did, but you can know God changed that man. He gave him the forgiveness. He gave him the cleansing. He gave them the, him the power in his life to live out what he spoke about. He could so relate himself with God to God that he would have the mind and spirit of God. This holy man was selected to denounce the wickedness of the world and give evidence 
that man empowered by God can actually keep the law, can be like Jesus. He showed it. Now I want you to go with me to the next passage. The next passage we want to see, now this first one, remember Enoch found that Jesus was enough. He found enough motivation and power to walk with God through his communion with him. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And now there's another passage that had Enoch, the Enoch that we're talking about, and that's in 1 Chronicles uh, 1, 3. But that was just in the gene genealogy, just pegged his name in there in the order of, uh, of the patriarchs. But now we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 11, verses 5 and 6. And here we're going to be looking at uh, a description here that I'm going to describe this way. Enoch found enough motivation and power to please God in contemplating his character. He found enough motivation and power to please God by contemplating his character. Go with me to verses 5 and 6 of chapter 11 of Hebrews. It says here that by faith Enoch was translated. Was it by faith that he was translated or did God just translate him? It was his faith that connect him, connected him with God and the grace from God that worked it all together that they just walked in lockstep together. They were thinking together. They were acting together. They were communing together. And they, they, they had walked so far together that it seemed like they were just, man, we're just closer to heaven now. Let's just come on in. And those angels brought them on in. But it says here, by faith he was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him you see, some of his, his closest friends, thank you, some of his closest friends actually uh, went looking for him. They, they thought that, well, those angels must have taken him, must have taken him to some of his favorite secluded spots because there were many times that Enoch, he knew, I cannot trust myself. I have got to watch out because the filth around me affects me just like it affects everybody else. He wasn't thinking, I can do that, I can read that, I can watch that, I can do that, I can be around that, and it doesn't affect me at all, because I'm close with God. He didn't have that attitude at all. He knew he was close to God, and that's why he wanted to be careful. So when he was in town, man, by God's grace, he was, he was, he was shining around him. But he knew it's time to go back. It's time to go back to my secluded home. And sometime he would take some from those cities back with him. But it's time to go back and have that time in communion with my heavenly father, communion with Jesus, that I am making sure I am loving him and I'm doing something else too. I'm hating something. I'm hating sin. Because you can't hate sin unless you love him. And if you love him, you can't but hate sin. And that's what Enoch was finding. That it, he found enough motivation and power to please God. We'll talk more about that here in a second. So on we go. Uh, verse 5, we're partway through it. Before his translation, oh, uh, so they went and looked for him in all those secluded places. And they came to the conclusion, you know what? He's not there. He's gone to be with God. He didn't die. He was taken. So he was translated. They, they came to the conclusion, yes, God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. You know, I so often, talking with young people different places, I've talked to people here, young people here. I've talked to older people here at times. And there often is a feel in people's hearts I just can't please him. I just can't do enough. I, I just can't seem to, to make it happen. 
or, or they have the idea it's just too high of a standard there. I'll never make it. I'll never please him. I'm here to tell you today, if Enoch can please God, so can you. So can you. He pleased God and he knew he was pleasing God. Some I've talked to, they're like, I don't know. I don't know if I'm pleasing him or not. You can know. If you're doing what he says, if you're opening yourself to him, if you're spending time in his word, you're communing with him, you bet you're, you're pleasing him. And act on that. Give your heart and life to that. You're pleasing him. You are pleasing him. And even if you were to fall, you have someone who's a faithful advocate who's going to bring you forgiveness that you need and give you the strength to get up and keep going with him. Don't give up. Get up and keep going. All right. So he pleased God, and he knew he pleased God. He could please God. So it's interesting in the sacred record, as it talks about him walking with God in the verse before and connecting with pleasing him now, you know, Genesis 6, 5 does not have a good description of humanity before the flood. It says, The wickedness of man was great in the earth, so that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's pretty, that has a lot of superlatives there. It's pretty bad. How different is it today? Not at all. The stuff going around on this, pla on this planet from the dark web mess and the human trafficking and, and just hedonism of some people just simply, I want to please myself and the more pleasure I can get today, the better. And I don't care about who I take down getting it. And that's what they were doing then. But Enoch's righteous life was in marked contrast with that of the wicked people around him. His piety, his purity, his unswerving integrity were the results of his walking with God. While the wickedness of the world was the result of their walking with who? Satan, the deceiver. That's who they were walking with, the deceiver of mankind. You see, there was something about Enoch that he found enough in God. In a relationship with him, a personal connection, he didn't care what people thought about what he wore, about what he had convictions in, about how he lived his life. It didn't matter what they said about him. Now, that does not mean that he didn't study people and find ways to reach them the best he could. But he did not worry about what they said about him. Because it wasn't about him anyway. Who was it about? It was about Jesus. That's what he was all about. I want you to see him the way I've seen him and seen him work in my life. I want you to have that too. And some did. Some did. He was an active worker. He did not seek ease and comfort. Sometimes we're that way. We look for the easiest way, comfortable way. Nor did he spend his time in idle meditation. I just want to go over and just meditate. Now, we need to meditate. We better spend time meditating. But if, if all we do is meditate, something's wrong. Because if you're meditating properly by God's grace, you will see so much that you can't wait to tell someone else. That's meditation. So he was an active worker. He was striving. He was not striving to gain happiness for himself. He did not participate in the festivities or the amusements that constantly engage the attention of pleasure lovers. 
He just refused to sleep and scroll his life away. I ain't going to do it. I'm not going to waste my time scrolling through that, watching that, doing that. I'm not going to do it. I've got too much to do. Life is too important. I'm on a mission. I'm not going to do it. And he's not going to do it because he's found that God was enough. Don't have to have that uh, recreational, maybe with a W. You understand me? W-R-E-C-K, creational, video watching. Ah, I have spelled it correct, rec, creation. Yeah, but he, he wasn't engaged in all of that kind of thing. He wouldn't do it. He was terribly, that's the way the Spirit of Prophecy says, I'm sharing a whole lot from uh, uh, an article in 1909, Lessons from the Life of Enoch. He was terribly in earnest. Now, sometimes my wife tells me I'm terribly in earnest, <laughs> not the same way that he was, but... Uh, to the excess and the wrong things, probably. He was terribly in earnest with the sinful and with the workers of iniquity. He mingled only as God's messenger to warn them to turn from their, with abhorrence from their evil ways and to repent and seek God. You see, Enoch realized that the purpose for believers are to so live their life that unbelievers would start to doubt their disbelief in God. Did you catch that? Oh, that got Jonathan sent that to me. Appreciated that. We need to live our lives so that unbelievers will start doubting their disbelief in God because they start to say, there's got to be something. There's got to be something going on behind the scenes supernaturally in that life. Let that be every one of us by his grace. Enoch did not become polluted with the iniquities existing in his day. Why need we in ours? But we may, like our master, Jesus, have compassion for, the suffering, for suffering humanity, pity for the unfortunate, and a generous consideration for the feelings and necessities of the needy, the troubled, the despairing. You see, he was all about connecting with God so he could bless others. That was what he focused on, because God was enough. He had enough motivation and power to please God, contemplating his character. So on we go here. Um, those who are Christians indeed will seek to do good to others and at the same time will so order their conversation and deportment or behavior as to maintain a calm, hallowed peace of mind. Selfishness, and worldliness just won't fit. It won't, they won't have room because you overcome evil with good. There's so much good, it doesn't fit. It can't fit. Jesus cursed the fig tree because it bore no fruit. Through the help provided, provided man in his fallen nature. Do you have a fallen human nature? I've got a fallen, fallen human nature. We all have a fallen human nature, and in our fallen human nature, uh, it says, through help provided from God, we can do the very things that God expects us to do. And if you're doing what God wants you to do, what are you doing to him? You are pleasing him. He can walk and work and live by faith in the Son of God. Let's go on, verse 6. And this really speaks to Enoch as well here, but without faith it is impossible to please him. So Enoch had faith. He was translated by faith. He pleased God by faith. And, and right here we see really what that means, or, or breaking it down. 
uh, it says, For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder. Not that he rewards a little bit, but he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Enoch knew by practice, by experience, I know he lives, I know he's alive, and I know he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. How? How did he know? By faith and by the evidence in his own heart and life as he stepped out by faith. You know, we're not to claim it till we see it. That's not faith, that's sight but claim that he's working in our lives now before we maybe even see the evidences there. I'm going to look at one other passage with you. And we go to, uh, we're going to read a whole book of the Bible, Jude. And in here, I want us to look, and it mentions Enoch here. And this, this, this book, the whole book, we're going to read the whole book. I'm actually going to read out a clear word, uh, parts of it, and then I'm going to finish it up with the other as we close. Uh, but this whole book, in some ways, Enoch is mentioned, in some ways it's kind of like written centuries later, but it explains what some of his ministry was like, what, it was, what was against him, so to speak, and what, was, uh, what he was trying to do. And I, I appreciated this. I found this just, just today looking at this. Uh, but the third item here is Enoch found enough motivation and power to give his life in unselfish service by beholding Jesus. By beholding Jesus. Now, follow along with me. The book of Jude, I'm going to read it out of Clear Word Bible. I haven't really done that before in the pulpit, but I'm going to do it today. Uh, let's, uh, you can go to your Bibles if you want, or just listen in as I share it. This letter is from Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and stepbrother of the Lord, uh, together with James, who's now guiding the church from Jerusalem. It is being sent to those who are loved by God, by, by God the Father, kept by Jesus Christ and called by the Holy Spirit. May God's mercy and peace and love be abundantly yours. I know that the message of Enoch that he was giving back then by the inspiration of what we've seen here and in this book, he was sharing about the character of God, the love of God, and he was calling people out of darkness into marvelous light of an experience with, with him. Look at verse 3. Dear believers, although I'm writing to clarify some things about salvation, the salvation we share, I also urge you to continue defending the faith entrusted to us against those who are challenging it. There was a lot of challenges. In fact, some might say, well, you know, it was a little bit easier for Enoch in his time than in our time now, trying to reach out to people as we are, you know, further degraded down, guess what? It wasn't easier. They had longer to develop their evil habits and lives. They, had lo they lived longer. So they were more developed in that mess. You can know it wasn't any easier for him than us. And we can sometimes say, oh man, you know, going against the flow, he knows all about that. And he could just give up when he says, you know, I was in that town for a, a, a whole weekend or a whole week and man, I don't, not many took it. Sometimes we can give up because it doesn't seem like we have quick results. But it wasn't any easier for him than us. He knows what that was like. Certain men of dubious reputation who have caused trouble in the past have slipped in among you. You need to be aware of them because they change the grace of God into permissiveness for all kinds of immorality, thus nullifying God's plan to save us from sin and denying that, Christ, that Jesus Christ is our only Master and Lord. He knew about righteousness by faith. He was righteous by faith, Enoch. And this is the message he was sharing. 
uh, verse 5. I want to remind you, even though you know it, that though God, had, God saved Israel and brought them out of Egypt, he destroyed those who were rebellious and refused to believe. Going back further in time, when some of the angels rebelled against God, he had to expel them from heaven and confine them to this world until the day of judgment, when they will be destroyed. Look at what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities. They were so filled with immorality, sodomy, and other sexual perversions that their destruction by fire is an example of what will happen to those who insist on living that way. The same kind of ungodly men have attached themselves to your congregation, living perverted and filthy lives. They reject authority, despise restraint, and are quick to accuse those in leadership of being unkind. In contrast to these ungodly men is the Lord Jesus. Also called Michael the archangel, for, for he is over the entire angelic host. When he was challenged by Satan about the intentions to resurrect Moses, he didn't come at Satan with a blistering attack, nor did he condemn him with mockery. He simply said, God rebuke you for claiming Moses' body. Ungodly men speak abusively against anything they don't understand and criticize what they know nothing about. They go by instinct and, and like irrational animals, end up destroying themselves. Condemnation is theirs. They have followed the path of Cain. They run after money as greedily as Balaam. The same rebellion is in their hearts as was in the heart of Korah, and they'll be destroyed as surely as he was. And then we come to this part. These men come to your fellowship dinners and eat with you as if nothing were the matter. They're like clouds that promise showers but are empty, carried away by the wind. They're like fruitless trees in har at harvest time, dried up at the roots, twice, as de twice dead. They're, uh, they're like untamed waves, bringing their foam and scum to the beach, like meteors that streak across the sky and disappear into the darkness. And then it says this, Enoch, the seventh in line from Adam, prophesied what would happen to such people when he said, I was shown in vision, the Lord coming to, the, coming to earth with 10,000 angels. He's coming to execute judgment and rebuke all the ungodly of all the ungodliness, their immorality, their arrogance, and the hard things that they have spoken against him. These people are constantly grumbling and finding fault. They, they indulge their own lust. They brag about themselves and flatter others uh, to get what they want. Dear friends, remember what the apostles of, our Lord Je of the Lord Jesus told us. They said in the last days, scoffers will come who will follow their own selfish desires, even questioning the promise of his coming. The problem is that these kind of people bring divisions into the church because they are guided by the spirit of this world and not by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. Now I want to talk a little bit more about some of the things mentioned here. Uh, let me share a little bit here. It says, uh, the lips, from the lips of Adam, the painful story of the fall, and the precious story of God's condescending grace in the gift of his Son as the world's Redeemer was learned by Enoch from Adam. He believed and relied upon the promise given. He realized the corruptions of the human family. Can you imagine the heartache of Adam when he's explaining to Enoch about why all this stuff is going on around him and trying to, to, to shelter that little guy, his great-great-great-great-grandson? He realized the corruptions of the human family and separated himself from the descendants of Cain and reprove them for their great wickedness. 
he chose to separate from them and spent much time in solitude. In fact, further down I read, um, Enoch chose periods for retirement. He would not suffer. Get this. Sometime it was like, I, I, I'm just, I'm off the grid. My phone is off. You know that if you are always available to others by your cell phone, you are not always available to God. Sometime that thing needs to be just, <laughs> I won't say that. Sometime it needs to be just turned off. Uh... I was going to say flush down the toilet, but I... <laughs> uh, no, it's a good tool used rightly. But Lord, help us use it rightly. Because that's the very place we rub shoulders with that which doesn't help us spiritually too often, and we know it. All right, on we go. The message that he had. Uh, oh, oh, there are times that he, was, he would not allow people to find him. He would, like, hide uh, for they interrupted his holy meditation and communion with God. He did not exclude himself at all times from the society of those who loved him and listened to his words of wisdom. But he met with the good and the bad at stated times. There's my schedule when I'm going to do it. Interesting. And he labored to turn the ungodly back from their evil course. Quite a description. And the message he had... You know, in, in speaking of this, he did not trust himself. He limited the exposure because he knew of the powerful influence of the enemy. All right, as we're coming close to the end here, he sought earnestly for a more perfect knowledge of his will in order to perform it. He yearned to unite himself more closely with God whom he feared and reverenced and adored. That's why he, he wanted to please God. That was his desire, and that is his testimony. That man pleased God. And I'm going to close with the last bit of Jude 20. Jude 20 uh, through 25. I'm reading it from my Bible here. It says, but ye, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Interesting, building up yourselves. Not a righteousness by works, but acknowledging it's what we've got to do in cooperation with him, with the motivation he's given us as we behold him. You see, Enoch behold, beheld God. He looked at the character of God. And that motivated him and gave him power to go forward, to really put everything into it. And he did. And so building yourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. It's only through the work of the Holy Spirit that any of this is possible. And then it says in verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God. The only way to do that is keep looking at Jesus and his character. Keep yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And some have compassion, and of some have compassion, making a difference. When we know Jesus, we want to help, and we will help, and it will make a difference. And then it says, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. God wants to make, he wants to build in us a love for him that is right connected with a hatred for sin because sin kills. Sin separates. Sin destroys. And he wants us to be free and he wants others to be able to be free in him, free indeed. And then 24 and 25, we know this is a song. You know, as I, well, let me read it. Now unto him that is able to keep who from falling? You from falling. In fact, when I read the two yous in this verse, will you do something for me? Read it with me and say your name when we get to the you. Will you do that for me? We need to internalize and personalize God's word. 
Say it with me. Now unto him that is able to keep Kevin from falling and to present Kevin faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever. Amen. That was the song of Enoch's heart. That you, that everyone he talked to, he says you can have this experience. Personalize it. Make it yours. You can have this. And I'm afraid that some of us are satisfied with something less. Somehow we get sometime the attitude of, I've got enough. I've got enough. I, I have a little bit of quiet time every once in a while, and I, you know, it's kind of meaningful at times. But if we're honest about it, let's be, let's be real with God. How about it? Some of us hold on to attitudes that keep us from God. They keep us from even looking to Him. Attitudes. Some of us hold on to habits that we know have no business in a Christian life. Habits on a phone, habits in private purity. And the life of Enoch reminds us there is enough motivation and power. There's enough in Jesus that as we behold him, as we contemplate his character, as we commune with him, there's enough to bring about the very thing that this promise is right here. We don't have to stay in a weak, powerless existence. And sometimes we have the idea, sometimes we have the thought, or we don't, we don't express it, but we have the mindset, I got to do that? No, you get to do this. Wow, I get to be like Jesus? Yeah. And he's just waiting for you to say, I want this. I want this. And I'm willing to cooperate and look to him, contemplate his character, commune with him. So I see him and I'm beholding him and I'm being drawn to him. It's possible for you. It's possible for me. I want to give opportunity for two things right now. One, if any of you sense that for you, you know, it's been me. It's, my, it's some of my attitudes, my choice of my thought patterns, my habits of thought, and my habits of life that I'm holding on to and I know I can't let go of. But I can see a God who can take it from me. And tonight, you want to say, by God's grace, I want to give it to him. If you want that for your life, and you sense, and this is a specific call, not, not, I'm not expecting for everyone, unless it's true for everyone. But if you want to say, Lord, I want to let go, by faith, let go of those habits, let go of those attitudes that stand between me and you. I invite you to stand with me. If that's true, and I'm not looking for everyone. I'm looking for those who say, I see this, and I, by God's grace, want to let him take it from me. Amen. He honors that. He loves you. He loves me. And for those of you who are... Uh, Remaining seated, seated, if you would like to just reconsecrate your life to Jesus. And, and by, you know, as I read about Enoch, this literally, folks, is what you will be if you are translated. That's an x-ray of you. You! Not someone else, but you. May that be our experience, truly. 
Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, as we look at the life of Enoch, I thank you for the encouragement we see here. We see a God who's able, not, not an Enoch that's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, more than we could imagine. But it's you doing something in him just like you by your grace are going to do in us. That we in this closing time of earth's history will be another shining light like him that will show the world there is reason to doubt your disbelief in God. Oh, Lord, we are not up to it, but I thank you that you are and more. Bless each of us, I pray, that we would find more and more of a genuine communion, contemplation of you, that we would know as we're beholding you, we are becoming changed. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are so pleased that you could join us for this special event here at Wachita Hills Academy and College. If you've enjoyed this presentation as much as I have, you can go ahead and like, share, and subscribe to this YouTube channel. Also, if you'd like to support making programs such as these, you can find donation information in the description below. Thank you so much again for joining us, and may God richly bless you.